Welcome, everyone, to Season 2 of Written in Blood History, now part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. I am truly grateful and honored to have you as a listener. Your continued listenership gives me the motivation to keep this little hobby of mine up, one which I thoroughly enjoy. Today's subject is one that I had on the docket for Season 1, but it kept getting postponed. Whenever I pick a biographical subject to do on this show, I need to be able to relate to them on some level. Otherwise, the passion just isn't there for me. Other history podcasters can do any subject anytime, anywhere, and that's great, but it's just not how I work. Our subject today was a slave of the American South before and during the Civil War. And so what could I, a guy with 100% Western European origin, relate to with a, a chattel slave of the South? How could I possibly do justice to his story? And I take this very seriously because even though this is just a a simple little history podcast, these were real people. And it's out of respect for the dead that I try to present them in a way that I think they would have liked to be presented, while, of course, staying factual and reasonable at the same time. But put simply, I was intimidated by the thought of doing a bio on somebody that I just had no way of relating to. And without a solid cross-section of experience, I was quite sure my attempt would fall short. But it turns out, this slave and I do have something in common. And it's something that was right in front of my face throughout the entire research phase. I simply failed to recognize it. And so, without further filibustering from me, I present to you the first subject of Season 2. And he is an awesome one. Robert Smalls, Born a Man. I am a husband and a father. For those of you in similar states of life as myself, you may relate to or understand the inevitable underlying fears that come with fatherly instincts. Is there enough money? Is there enough food? Is this the best that I can do for my family? But then again, these fears, once set against the backdrop of all of human history, seem a bit ridiculous, don't they? In the modern Western world, we have so many safety nets. My family's not going to starve from potato blight. There's no Vikings crashing upon our shores. No plagues wiping out half the population. No blue cap Gestapo whisking people away in the dead of night. No freight cars destined for incinerators or mass graves or gold stars marking what our religion is. There's not even any real big wars anymore. We no doubt have our ongoing inequities in our society and... Many are worse off than others, but generally, as a husband and a father, this is probably the easiest time in all of history for such a responsibility. All of this is a long-winded way of saying how deeply I am impacted by the plight of Robert Smalls. He bore the responsibilities as a husband and a father in a state of life that, frankly, I think would have utterly broken me, but not him. He was born property. He was a chattel slave of the American South. But that was not going to stop him from doing his duty. Lydia Polite gave birth to her baby boy in a small, dark, and dirty slave quarters in Beaufort, South Carolina. It was April 5th, 1839. She named her boy Robert. Buford had a huge slave population. The white populace lived with the ever-present fear that the slaves would rise in revolt. A reasonable fear. It's happened before. But the risk was worth it. Cotton was the crude oil of the day, and Buford was a deep well. Lydia's master, a 27-year-old man named Henry McKee, was a cotton planter. Owning a pregnant female slave was generally a good deal. At his birth, Lydia's baby Robert became Henry's property. Two for the price of one. I spoke earlier about the difficulties of being a father, but what about motherly instincts towards a newborn? The typical rations for a chattel slave of the South consisted of mainly corn, with perhaps some helpings of molasses or a bit of meat every once in a while. 
Can you imagine being a nursing mother and you're surviving off of rations? And the rations were sort of a joke. Almost every slave household needed to supplement with their own private garden patches, growing whatever they could manage. And these weren't small patches either. Kate Lineberry, who wrote the biography that I'm using for my principal source, says a slave family would often get three to five acres of their own private crop. This naturally created something of an underground market among the slaves, and it was unregulated by the dictates of Southern society. Families would trade and exchange goods to obtain specialty items like sugar or coffee. Their own masters at times would purchase their slaves' goods. These exchanges were a small bit of freedom. They were their own masters in this tiny little economic domain. Another unexpected freedom developed among the Southern slaves, that of the tongue. Robert's mother was, per the norm for the time, not permitted to be taught to read or write, so she learned Gullah, a language created from the cultural cocktail of various African tribes all thrown together in the same cotton fields. But, as anyone who listened to my Tolkien episode knows, language is not just meaningless utterances of sounds. Language is culture. Every word has history and depth and meaning, and for the people speaking it, every intonation carries emotion from the past. New traditions founded on the strands of those brought across the Atlantic filled the cabins of the slave populace across the South. They were now a people. And this language was the freedom of their identity. In an age when the smallest infractions, such as walking about the town without a pass, could earn a woman 20 lashes on her bare back, these freedoms of the spirits were soul-saving. Lydia was more fortunate than many other slaves of the day. She was a house servant. At the age of nine, she was ripped from her mother's arms in the fields from another plantation six miles away to work in her new master's quarters. The work was preferable to the fields, for sure, but the sudden sundering of family is tragic. Can you imagine having your nine-year-old ripped from your life? I can't. Lydia never said who Robert's father was, and she never gave any clues either. And the surname of Smalls is no help. Robert chose that name for himself, as was customary for slaves. Smalls himself later said that when a slave chooses their own surname, they never let their masters know what it is, because it's theirs. It's something that they owned that could not be taken from them. And so Robert grew into a hard-working young man in Henry McKee's household. He cleaned his boots, he chopped his wood, he tended the fire and pitched water from the well. Kate Lineberry points out that Robert's contemporaries noted his positive work ethic. Quote, Robert seemed to fare well and carried out his duties as instructed. He was smart, capable, and well-liked by the McKee family. A McKee relative wrote in the 1870s that Smalls was, quote, raised in our family as a houseboy, always proved himself intelligent and of kind disposition, end quote. According to Lineberry, Lydia had a desire for her growing boy to have a very realistic grasp of his state in life. So she took him to downtown Beaufort to witness reality. There, he saw a slave auction. He saw men, women, and children being ripped from each other's arms, examined, and then sold to the highest bidder. She then took Robert to the town jail to witness a slave being whipped for God knows what. It's not exactly clear what Lydia hoped to accomplish by this, and further, it's not exactly clear what Robert took away from it either. But I think it's fair to say that it got Robert thinking about his own freedom. As ridiculous as it sounds, he was a more privileged slave for the time. He wasn't in the fields, and his master was generally kind and lenient, but that could always change. Robert would have no control over it. He later recalled these terrible truths of the slave system of the South. Quote, I have seen a good deal in traveling around the plantations. I have seen stocks in which the people are confined for 24 to 48 hours. In whipping, a man is tied up to a tree and gets a hundred lashes from a raw hide. Sometimes, a man is taken to a blacksmith's shop and an iron of 60 pounds weight is fastened to his feet so that when it is taken off, he cannot walk for days. I have heard of whipping a woman in the family way by making a hole in the ground for her stomach. My aunt was whipped so many times until she had not the same skin she was born with. They were whipped until the blood came and then washed down with salt and water. End quote. It may have been that Lydia knew it was inevitable that her son would one day be taken from her, 
and she decided the faster he grew up, the better. And then, it finally happened. At the age of 12, Robert was outsourced by his master, Henry McKee, to work in Charleston, never to see his mother Lydia again. For Robert, going to Charleston would have been like visiting Vegas for the first time. The port city was booming with activity, and old money was everywhere. Horse-drawn carriages were driven by slaves, and they packed the cobblestone roads. Slaves were also everywhere. At the time, according to Lineberry, Charleston had 43,000 citizens and another 20,000 slaves. It's an enormous ratio. It served as something of a slave hub for the entire continent. 40% of the Atlantic slave trade flowed through Charleston. And not only were the slaves everywhere, but so too were privatized slave markets tucked away in halls and buildings to keep the dirty little business out of public view. There, the poor souls were paraded naked in front of a scrupulous crowd looking for flaws and imperfections. The young, the strong, and the beautiful always went first. To show he had permission to walk about the town, Robert was given a small diamond-shaped badge that he had to wear on his vest. It distinguished him from free blacks who occupied the city, many of whom were quite wealthy and, as Lineberry points out, were fully invested in the slave economy of Charleston, owning many slaves for themselves. Twelve-year-old Robert found various modes of employment that kept him gaining more exposure and experience in the wide world. He worked as a waiter at a hotel, a gaslighter for the city's new gas lamps, Soon, he found himself working on the Charleston docks, loading and unloading cargo, and working alongside the freed and enslaved alike, as well as a new downtrodden group of immigrants from a faraway land called Ireland. Robert's work ethic shined again. He was promoted to driving the hoisting horses to load and unload the barges, then promoted to the rigging loft. From there, he was taught to make ropes and sails, and from there, he was hired as a sailor. Now, at 17, and feeling relatively accomplished, Robert Smalls had decided that it was time to begin looking for a wife. And he was quite pragmatic about this next step, saying, quote, My idea was to have a wife to prevent me from running around, to have somebody to do for me, and to keep me. End quote. He found a wife in another slave, hired out as a maid, named Hannah Jones. Hannah, we know, was over 30, an odd match for a 17-year-old, but in some way... Somehow, the marriage made sense for the both of them, and they tied the knot on Christmas Eve, 1856. Hannah had two daughters already, and as soon as she and Robert were married, Robert, at 17, had basically overnight found himself with significantly more responsibilities than he had before. He was suddenly a family man. Generally, slaves were not permitted to marry, though many slave owners tended to look the other way, since it acted as a deterrent for slaves who might get any silly notions of running away. But Hannah's master, a man named Samuel Klingman, didn't just allow a slave to marry out of magnanimity or pragmatism. He only agreed to the union if Robert paid him $5 a month while they were married. This would be something like $150 today. Robert had no choice but to agree to this. Soon, Hannah gave birth to Robert's first daughter, Elizabeth Lydia Smalls. Little Elizabeth Lydia was obviously named so to honor Robert's beloved mother. Now 19 years old, with a growing family, Robert no doubt had the ever-present fear that his family might be soon torn asunder. So he offered to buy Hannah from Klingman, her master. Klingman agreed, but the price would be $800. It was just money Robert didn't have. And so the couple began a savings. Robert was only able to keep a dollar of his monthly wages, which works out to be something like $30 today, while all the rest went to his master. And so, for their savings, Hannah began laundering sailors' shirts at the waterfront, and their plan was far from perfect even if they managed to save enough, because when the time came that they might purchase Hannah's freedom, Robert was still owned by Henry McKee. And as long as Robert was a slave, their little nuclear family would forever be in danger. As every agonizing day went by, they saw more and more families separated. More and more tears, more lashes, more whips... Robert knew it was inevitable that tragedy would strike his family. He knew they did not have the time to buy Hannah's freedom. He knew they must escape. Robert's decision to begin plotting out an escape came just as it appeared the nation would descend into civil war. On December 20, 1860, South Carolina voted unanimously to leave the Union. In response... Union Major Robert Anderson reinforced Fort Sumter just off the coast of Charleston. 
South Carolina had then determined to starve out Anderson and his troops, but Anderson refused to surrender the fort, and on April 12, 1861, the Confederacy fired the first shots of the Civil War. Robert Smalls could have seen the attack happening from the shores of Charleston, and he probably did. He also would have seen the fort fall into the hands of the Confederacy. And on top of this, his family was continuing to grow. Hannah had just given birth to a son, Robert Jr. With war now driving everything in the South, private merchant ships found lucrative work in running errands for the new Confederate government. Robert Smalls, now 22, found work as a deckhand aboard one of these vessels, a sidewheel steamship named the Planter. The owner of the Planter, a man named John Ferguson, had agreed to pay Smalls $16 a month, although, of course, 15 of it went to Smalls' owner, John McKee. But nonetheless, it was good work learning a valuable skill. The captain of the ship, a man named Relay, who always donned a straw hat, recognized Robert's work ethic and promoted him to wheelman. After a few months of hauling Confederate cargo and men, Robert Smalls was a trusted, skilled, and experienced sailor. He could steer the planter in his sleep, and he knew every sandbar in the inlet of Charleston Harbor. The planter was one of the jewels of the southern fleet. It was built from oak and red cedar, and it was powered by two wood-burning engines that propelled a wheel on each side. It boasted three decks, a sleeping quarters, a pilot house, and a huge smokestack, and it could also operate in less than four feet of water, making it a valuable craft in the shallow and sandy ports of South Carolina. And now that it was in military service, it was equipped with a 32-pound pivot gun and a 24-pound howitzer. The boat's owner, Ferguson, was bringing home the pretty sum of $125 per day, leasing it out to the Confederacy. But by late 1961, things were already not looking good for Charleston. A huge armada of Union ships had very deliberately blockaded the city. Beaufort, Robert's hometown, was evacuated by the landed whites, leaving behind all their slaves and sort of transforming the old town into a black-only community. And Charleston itself had nearly burned to the ground in a fire. The damage to infrastructure as well as morale was catastrophic. Charleston was the heart of the rebellion, and now barely into the war its citizens were near destitute. During all these dramatic events, Robert Smalls had sensed his moment was approaching. The time was nearly right for an escape. He just couldn't figure out how to do it. One day, when the planter's captain, Relay, was away, another shipmate placed the captain's famous straw hat on Robert, who shared a similar stocky build as the captain. The crew immediately joked on how similar Robert looked to the captain with the hat on. From then forward, Robert Smalls had a plan. Now, this plan was not without major complications. First, it would take more men than himself to operate the planter, so he needed to enlist the help of other slaves aboard his ship and then hope they don't spill the beans. If their plan was sniffed out, death was certain. Being the fastest ship in the harbor, and thus a favorite for war correspondence, the planter was often moored right next to the local Confederate general's headquarters amid many a watchful eye. If they successfully stole the ship, they would then have to navigate past all the military boats in Charleston Harbor without alerting suspicion, and then keep up the ruse as they floated by the ominous Confederate-controlled Fort Sumter. All of this was a seemingly impossible task for a loud, smoky steamship that everybody knew was operated by three white officers. And if all of that was successful, they would then have to figure out a way to approach the Union blockade without getting blown out of the water. This final part of the plan was perhaps the most dangerous, as it was common in these days for ironclads to pummel each other with underwater rams. The Union Army would most certainly be on alert for such attacks. Despite the terrifying obstacles, Robert Smalls had made his designs known to the other slaves who worked on the planter. There were John Small, who's not related to Robert, Alfred Gordine, David Jones, Jack Gibbs, Gabriel Turner, and Abraham Jackson. Smalls knew he had to reveal his plan to his wife, Hannah, as well. She asked him what would happen if the plan failed. He said, quote, I shall be shot, end quote. She replied, quote, It is a risk, but you and I and our little ones must be free. I will go, for where you die, I will die, end quote. As the days went by, Robert kept a keen eye out for the right moment, but their plan was suddenly at risk of being exposed when one of the plotters, David Jones, began getting cold feet. Alfred Gordine recounted how they handled Jones, quote, He was given to talk, and whenever he got a hold of whiskey, he wanted to tell all he knew. 
He was alright at first, but after a few days he began to weaken and predict disaster, and was evidently ready to give the whole thing away. In this emergency, we got at him one night and threatened his life if he did not brace up, and thus frightened him into being steadfast. End quote. On May 12, 1862, the planter had loaded up massive cannons and other munitions that the Confederacy desperately needed. The next morning, they were to be delivered to Fort Ripley in the harbor. As day turned to dusk, the three white officers made it known that they intended to return to Charleston to spend the night with their families. In doing so, they were technically breaking Confederate military orders. Even though they had done it several times before, according to Confederate law, ship crews had to sleep on their vessels in the event that they were needed in a moment's notice. It was the moment Robert Smalls had been waiting for, and it coincided with a few other critical events. The main guard boat in the harbor had broken down and was being repaired. Smalls knew this. He also knew that the next morning, Charleston was going to be placed under martial law for fear of Union attack. Martial law would freeze all activity in the harbor, and no escape would be possible then. For Robert Smalls, it was tonight or never. But then, at the last minute, one of the white captains exclaimed that he would remain on board the planter for the evening instead of going home. The slaves then turned to Smalls, expecting him to call everything off. Gordine recounts Smalls' reaction, quote, He wouldn't give up, saying that he would either lock the mate in his stateroom or kill him. It was finally decided to go ahead, but we had scarcely come to that conclusion when the man went ashore and thus saved his bacon. If he had remained with us, he'd either have been carried out to sea as a captive or thrown overboard as a corpse, end quote. As was typical at dusk, the men's wives and families came to visit them aboard the steamer. Hannah knew what was about to transpire, but the other wives did not. Gordine recounts the other women's reactions when the plan for the night was revealed to them. Quote, they didn't know much about war, but they knew enough to realize that every man of us would be shot or hung if the attempt was a failure. They cried and prayed and entreated, and if Smalls hadn't had the grit of a bulldog, he would have let go. It took an hour to calm those women down, and then we locked them in the staterooms and threatened to kill the first one who made a loud noise. End quote. But the women couldn't stay aboard the planter. Smalls knew the Sentinels were watching the harbor, and the Sentinels were entirely used to the families visiting the men and then leaving for the night. And so the women and the children left the planter, just as they always had, except this time with instructions to be waiting upriver on another boat. So the planter sat silently in the harbor. But at 3 a.m., they began adding wood to the fires, bringing the boilers up to temperature. So far, so good. The sentinels had not suspected the usual movement of the wives and children, and the burning wood had not alerted anyone in the wharf that anything out of the ordinary was occurring. Finally, as first light began to creep over the horizon, and the nighttime fog began to thin, Robert Smalls stepped into the pilot room, he donned his captain's straw hat, and he ordered the crew to raise two flags, the stars and bars of the Confederacy and the state flag of South Carolina. He then began to pilot the steamer away from the shore. Smalls blew the loud, piercing whistles of his boat, letting everyone in the harbor know that the planter was off for another very normal mission. The Confederate guard was a mere 50 feet from the planter as she left, never suspecting a thing. Smalls directed the planter towards the designated ship in the wharf that concealed the loved ones of the desperate fathers and husbands. Once it stopped near the ship, the families quietly and briskly hopped aboard the planter. From here, Smalls calmly floated the steamer two miles to Fort Johnson. It was the first of many fortified islands that they would have to pass without raising any suspicion. Each one had enough firepower to sink the planter in seconds. With the women and children below deck, and the men aboard acting casual... They passed the fort without incident. Just then, a guard boat patrolling the harbor came a little too close for comfort. The gunboat passed by without thinking anything was wrong, and Robert had an instinct that it was time to pick up the pace. Alfred Gordeen, who was working in the engine room, recalls the moment Smalls called for more steam. Quote, John and I were alone down there. When the call came for a full head of steam, I was taken so weak that I could barely stand. And when I looked at John, his face was the color of wood ashes. We were both as scared as rabbits in front of a dog, and it was the same with all the others, except Robert Smalls. If he lost his nerve for a single moment, nobody noticed it. End quote. The next major obstacle was getting past the formidable Fort Sumter. On their way, they passed boat after boat. 
and as they came close to a couple of small barges with a straw hat in the dark of the pilot room, Robert Smalls shouted good morning to the other pilots. When they came to an anchored gunboat, Smalls casually tooted the steamer's whistle as a salute to the heavily armored vessel and simply kept paddling forward. Finally, at 4.15 a.m., Fort Sumter's 50-foot walls loomed over the planter. The Confederates had essentially blockaded the bay so that any ships entering or exiting the area would have to pass directly under the heavy guns of the fort. There was risk of being discovered, risk of being boarded, and occasionally risk of being stopped to perform some random errand deemed a military necessity. This was the dangerous gateway of deliverance for Robert Smalls, his family, and everybody aboard the planter. He knew he had to risk it. From Gordine, quote, when we drew near the fort, every man but Robert Smalls felt his knees giving way, and the women began crying and praying again. End quote. To be granted passage by Fort Sumter, a signal was required. Robert knew the signal, and he blew two long whistles and one short one. The sentinel in the parapet of the fort had actually mistaken the planter for the guard boat of the harbor and assumed it was off on some mission. He yelled out to the planter, quote, Blow the damn Yankees to hell, or bring one of them in. End quote. Robert Smalls enthusiastically replied, Aye, aye. Gordine recounts the intense moment as they cleared Fort Sumter and made their way into unpatrolled waters. Quote, For a half an hour, we expected to hear the boom of a big gun at any instant, and when we finally got out of range and realized that we had actually escaped, there was more weeping and praying and singing of Alleluia songs. End quote. Robert Smalls had accomplished what seemed impossible. He had done what he so long desired. He had freed his family from the iron bonds of slavery. They were free. The men who helped him were free. All the women and children aboard were now free. Whatever fate lay before them was now theirs, and it was theirs by their own choice. They now owned it. And it was around this time that Captain Relay had appeared at the docks to begin preparing his ship for its next mission. To his astonishment, the planter was simply not there and he probably had an inkling of what had happened, but he also didn't immediately raise any alarms. You see, Relay had been breaking military orders by sleeping ashore, and he knew that he was going to be blamed for this catastrophe. The Sentinels at Fort Sumter soon realized something was wrong, because the steamship they had just granted passage to was not headed in the expected course. It was, in fact, headed straight for the Union blockade. So they raised an alarm that the ship was being stolen, and they tried to get the attention of the next closest fort to the absconding vessel. But it was too late. Robert had already ordered more steam from the engine room, pushing them well beyond the grasp of their former masters. Though Robert and company were now free, they had one last deadly serious challenge ahead of them. They had to approach the Union fleet without getting blown out of the water. I already mentioned the tactic of ramming ships, so any naval captain worth his salt took no chances with approaching vessels. Luckily, finding the Union fleet was easy. It formed a massive arching blockade 13 miles long all around Charleston Harbor. And when the fleet was in sight, Robert's crew drew down the Confederate and the South Carolina flags and hoisted up a white bedsheet, hoping to God somebody on the Union boats would see it in the dark of the early morning. But now, Mother Nature had plotted against them as a heavy fog rolled back into the harbor, obscuring the vessels from one another. A Union ship, a clipper named the Onward, had spotted the approaching steamer, and it wasn't hard. All the steam and smoke and paddle wheel thrashing made them an obvious yet obscure shadow in the fog. Captain of the Onward, John Frederick Nichols, reacted as expected. To him it looked like an early morning Confederate attack on the blockade. So he woke his men and he ordered them to their battle stations. He then turned his clipper around so that all the port side cannons were aimed directly at the planter. The situation must have been incredibly tense, as the men and women and children aboard the planter no doubt could hear the orders being barked aboard the Onward. But just as Captain Nichols was about to unleash hell on that stolen ship, he spotted the white flag of surrender, and he ordered his gunners to stand down. Nichols then shouted to the planter, which was just feet away at this point, quote, Stop or I will blow you out of the water, end quote. Robert Smalls replied, quote, Good morning, sir. I have brought you some of the old United States guns, sir, that were for Fort Sumter, sir. End quote. Robert's duties as a husband and a father were met on this morning. He had delivered his family to freedom. Gone was the risk of him being sold down the river, torn asunder from his loved ones. 
His child would not be ripped from his arms to work in some field or kitchen. His wife would not be lashed or raped by some lustful monster. His girls and his boy, Robert Jr., would be his own to raise as he saw fit. He had given his family a freedom that just hours ago was unimaginable. When Captain Nichols and his men boarded the planter, Robert and his men asked Nichols if he could spare an American flag. Nichols happily obliged, taking down the white bedsheet and hoisted the stars and stripes of the Union. Hannah Smalls picked up her boy, Robert Jr., pointed to the flag and told him, quote, It'll do you good. End quote. Back in Charleston, the military leadership was in disbelief. How could this happen? How could a crew of low-life, know-nothing slaves outsmart their masters? But Robert had done more than just embarrass them by delivering a valuable ship to the enemy. He had a wealth of military intelligence to share as well. To the Union officers, he gave them the Confederate torch codes, a form of communication known as wigwags. It was how the boats in the harbor communicated to each other. He told them of the dilapidated state of the guard boat in the harbor, as well as various weaknesses throughout the island defenses that the Union would have otherwise had no knowledge of. And further, that many of the troops had left Charleston to aid the fighting in Tennessee and Virginia. He also handed Captain Nichols a newspaper, giving them valuable insight into the terrified state of mind the harbor town was in. Small's information was forwarded to the Navy superiors as, quote, thorough and complete as to the whole defense of Charleston, end quote. Speaking of Southern newspapers, spin was put on the planter's story immediately. First, they outright denied that the event had even occurred, but once the planter was spotted amidst the Union blockade, that facade was over. Next, they concluded that Smalls and company must have had white help. And in a way, that's not wrong. For had Captain Relay and his officers obeyed military orders and stayed aboard that night, I would not be doing a podcast on Robert Smalls and his escape from Charleston. An Englishman who happened to be in Charleston during these events wrote, quote, Nothing has so much exasperated the Charlestonians as the daring feat of Robert Smalls, the Negro slave, who so boldly and gallantly took possession of the steamer planter and proceeded with her past the fort and battery and finally delivered her to Uncle Sam's gunboats. There was doubt and speculation and finally rage and unmitigated spleen predominating that day throughout the Palmetto City when the planter was missed from her wharf. End quote. The Charleston military knew Smalls would be passing along devastating intelligence, one of them writing, quote, The Negro pilot aboard the boat is thoroughly acquainted with every channel or creek heading to Charleston, and knows also that we are for the present utterly undefended, End quote. Within hours of the escape, Smalls was brought before Admiral DuPont, the man in charge of the entire blockade, telling him his story. DuPont was so impressed with Robert that he offered him a job to serve aboard the planter, the very ship he stole, and Robert Smalls jumped at the offer. His story spread through the North and the South like wildfire. The United States legislature unanimously passed a bill allowing for Smalls and his crew to be compensated for the delivery of the planter. The bill was then signed by President Lincoln. Though the appraisal of the planter came in lower than it should have, Robert was proud to put it and himself in the service of the Union. He was now being paid a fair wage for his work and got to keep every bit of it. Soon he would meet and recount his story with President Abraham Lincoln himself. After his publicity tour of sorts, Robert then returned to the service of the Union Navy, where he came under fire and fierce naval battles. And though he had delivered his family to freedom, he could not ultimately protect them from loss. Robert and Hannah's son, Robert Jr., died as a child from smallpox. Despite the tragedy, Robert continued in the service of the Union. Later, in one battle, a man named Commodore McDonough was commanding the planter. The shelling was so intense that the Commodore lost his nerve and took refuge in the coal bunker. So Robert Small stepped up to pilot his old ship once again. Quote, there was nothing for me to do save take charge, and I brought her safe from under fire and out of danger. End quote. The Commodore was relieved of his position and replaced by Smalls. Smalls? Now captain of the planter was making $150 a month, a far cry from the standard $13 per month for most black soldiers, and further still from the $1 he was allowed to keep as a slave. One day while Robert Smalls was in Philadelphia for a speech, he and one of the white men who was serving with him on the planter boarded a streetcar. The conductor told Smalls that being a man of color, he was required to ride on the front platform outside the car. Smalls refused, and he left the car. His white subordinate turned to the conductor and said, quote, I will follow my captain, end quote. 
On April 14, 1865, Robert Smalls was ordered to bring the planter to Fort Sumter for what was destined to be an emotional ceremony of, once again, raising the American flag over the fort where the bloody war began. Pulling up to the harbor shore, Smalls commiserated with many of the white men that he had once been acquainted with as a slave. One of them noted how he had helped build the planter. Another said that he had built the engines and the boilers. Smalls remarked that he had put the polish on it. Exactly four years to the day, after Major Anderson had lowered the flag and surrendered to the rebels, he was back to raise that same flag again. And he was so overcome with emotion that he could barely deliver his speech. Quote, By the considerate appointment of the honored Secretary of War, I am here to fulfill the cherished wish of my heart through four long years of bloody war to restore to its proper place this dear flag, which floated here during peace before the first act of this cruel rebellion. I thank God I have lived to see this day and to be here to perform this duty to my country. My heart is filled with gratitude to that God who has given us blessings beyond measure. May all the world proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards man. End quote. The tattered flag was then unfurled and raised and the crowd erupted in cheers and tears. Later that night, Abraham Lincoln would be assassinated. After the war... The federal government had to deal with enormous amounts of abandoned and confiscated southern real estate. So auctions became all the rage. In Beaufort, where Smalls was born, the white plantation owners had utterly abandoned everything. So all these slaves were purchasing their former master's properties at auction. Robert Smalls, too, went back and he purchased the very home he was born in. The very home that his mother Lydia had raised him in and around, where he was taught to be a man. After moving his family into the Buford property, Smalls wrote, quote, I am proud of the fact that I live in a dwelling built on the very ground where I was born. The old homestead and its surroundings are mine, and I shall leave it for my children to enjoy. End quote. As Smalls attained financial success, the McKee family, his former masters, who had once dwelt in the house he now owned, fell on hard times and he invited the surviving members of his former masters to stay in the home with his family for a while. He even paid for the railway fare. And they were grateful, though they still refused to break tradition by eating at the same table as blacks. So Smalls graciously had a separate eating quarter set up for the downtrodden family. One of the McKee daughters was in financial dire straits, so Smalls gave her a sum of cash and helped her 16-year-old son gain appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. But not all were willing to forgive and forget the damage Smalls had done to the Confederate cause. One day, while giving some Union officers a tour of the southern coast aboard the planter, another steamer was headed right for their boat. It was a man who was paid by the former owner of the planter to steal it back. Smalls, who knew he was about to be rammed, but was also the superior navigator, was able to evade the ram and in turn ended up ramming the opposite steamer and began pushing it up the Savannah River. Now, thoroughly enraged, the captain of the opposing ship pulled out a revolver and pointed it at Smalls. Smalls then produced a double-barrel shotgun and pointed it back at him, saying, quote, Now shoot, and mind you, don't miss, for I won't. End quote. Once on shore, the Union officers had the man arrested. Robert Smalls was now living the 19th century American dream. He had achieved financial success, he was sending his daughters to the best schools in the country, one was studying classical literature, and the other was studying music. One Fourth of July, his daughter Elizabeth read aloud the Declaration of Independence in the Beaufort Town Square to a crowd of illiterate former slaves. Smalls then helped found a school for African American children in Beaufort, and he joined the South Carolina State Militia, eventually rising to the rank of Major General. And then he founded the first Republican Party chapter in Beaufort. His political career took off, and soon he became one of the first African-American members of the U.S. Congress, serving five terms in the House. His daughter Elizabeth worked as his secretary. Just think about where we are right now in this narrative. Robert Small is born a chattel slave to an illiterate mother on a dirt floor shanty in Beaufort, South Carolina, was now a member of the United States Congress. His story arc is staggering. At the age of 75, from diabetes, Robert Smalls passed from this world in the home that he loved, the place of his birth. His funeral service was held at the First African Baptist Church in Beaufort. The choir sang, Shall We Meet Beyond the River? <laughs> 
Robert Smalls was many things in his life. He was a hard worker. He was a masterful wheelman at sea. He was charismatic. He was a daring fighter throughout his life and in different arenas. He was an accomplished public servant and a successful businessman. And he was a slave who, through will and cunning, broke from the thraldom of the American South. But more than that, if all those things can be topped with a a singular achievement, something truly transcendent, something closer to an instinctual sacred duty, he was a good husband and father, and he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had a profound responsibility to free his family, and he did it. Once, while giving one of his speeches, entertaining his audience with his usual charm and retelling of his escape, he paused and interjected a thought that had entered his mind. Quote, Although I was born a slave, I always felt that I was a man, and I ought to be free. And I would be free or die. Robert Smalls was one hell of a guy that definitely doesn't get enough recognition in the history books. If you enjoyed this episode and deem it worthy of a dollar, I would sure appreciate that dollar. You can head over to patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory to become a sponsor of the show. Over there, I post some research material every now and again and also get you the new episodes a few days early. Another huge way to help me is to leave a rating or review wherever you listen. Those little morale boosts do wonders for organic listenership, so I definitely appreciate that. I need to extend a big thank you to my kid sister, Courtney, for her awesome cover art. You can find more of her work at cjdejulius.myportfolio.com. And another shout-out to Dario for the awesome music he produces for the show. You can find a link to his YouTube channel on the show page. If you want to get a hold of me, my Twitter handle is at sdjulius, or send me a message on the show Facebook page. This little podcast of mine is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. If you're looking for more awesome shows, head on over to evergreenpodcast.com. And until next time, thank you so very, very much for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.